A 4th of July party turns into a terrifying ordeal for all involved. And then we take a look at the curious case of Thomas Meehan, a businessman who left work and was headed home. But he never reached home. He was spotted in three locations around town, and in one of those locations, he was already dead. Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you guys are having a great day too. Season 6 starts now. Now you may go, hmm, Jason, the audio quality's a bit different. I'm on vacation, man. I'm in sunny, sunny California. In sunny, sunny Sacramento. Sack of potatoes, sack of tomato. The city that always sleeps. I'm kicking it down here. It's like 97 degrees. I'm in an unair conditioned apartment like I normally am because I can't have air conditioners or fans running while I record this show. So if you hear the occasional drip drop, that is sweat leaving my body. But we got a lot of good stuff for you today. We got two really interesting stories. The first story just happened. It actually happened as I basically, while I was recording, the end of season five was on July 4th. So this episode, basically, all of this stuff was transpiring while I was messing around. And actually, it was all transpiring while all of us were watching fireworks or sleeping because we're 80 years old. But remember what you were doing 4th of July. Think about what you were doing 4th of July. And now forget that. Forget that happened because we are going on an adventure. We are going to Bodega Bay. Bodega Bay, little town in California. The sunny, sunny state. I'm just joking. Okay, so anyways, sun's always in California. Anyway, so I'm surprised there's no conspiracies yet about the earthquakes. I'm surprised there's no one saying that it's the lizard people. or I saw someone trying to say that the LA earthquakes was a sign that the Yellowstone geyser was going to blow up the planet. Not a geyser. It's actually like a super volcano under there, and it is quite dangerous. But I'm surprised we don't get more. I wonder how flat earthers, how they explain earthquakes. Anyways, anyways, I should should note to self, look up what maniacs think about natural events. Back to Bodega Bay. Let's go ahead and get started with the saga of Bataille Coffee. Bataille Coffee is a 32-year-old man. Stanford graduate. Upper crust. Upper crust, old chum. Actually, he's born and raised in L.A. But anyways, Bataille Coffee is like, he's a software engineer at YouTube right now. Well, was. He wakes up from a coma earlier this week. He wakes up from a coma. He can't move the left side of his body. He's like, what, what, what happened? Sexy nurses are all walking around, taking his temperature, like filling out charts. A uh, little short nurse skirts. And they're like, oh, the patient's awake. This is my dream hospital. Not this guy. This guy doesn't need to be there. But a bunch of sexy nurses are like, oh, let's go get the doctor. Doctor comes in. Sexy female doctor. Even shorter skirt. I didn't even know it was possible. She comes in. She goes, Mr. Coffee, you're awake. And he's like, what happened? What happened to me? She goes, well, first off, everything we're about to talk about is alleged. And secondly, everything we're about to talk about is true. And it's a legend in the sense that everything that happened, like the first part, is true, but it's a legend whether or not Coffee did it. And Coffee's like, what does any of that have to do with my medical condition? I want to know why I can't move the left side of my body. And Sexy Doctor turns back away from the camera and goes, well, Mr. Coffee, I think the police should explain to you what happened. Maybe you can answer a few questions. She gives a sexy wink at us as she walks out of the hospital room. So here's what happened. That was our little intro for the day. Here's what happened. Coffee, 32-year-old Patai Coffee, software engineer for YouTube, Stanford educated, good old chum, cream of the crop of American society, is hanging out with five of his buddies in Bodega Bay. They rented a place so they could spend 4th of July all the weekend partying at this house. Now, I don't know. I party. I'll kick it with a couple friends drink a couple beers, if that. Usually I just hang out and talk about Magic the Gathering. But these guys said, nah, nah, we're not none of those plebs. We're not any of those working class that drinks Budweiser. Let's drop acid. Taking it up a level, I guess. But anyways, they decide to drop acid. Now, I know a lot of my listeners do acid. Not a, not a sizable amount. But I know a lot of people have experimented with it. I don't mess with hallucinogens. I already see ghosts flying around me. 
not all the time. I'm not a lunatic, but the 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 line is so thin where if I saw a goblin just appear, I'd be like, oh my god, that goblin's real. So I don't want to take a drug that's go- going to increase the likelihood of goblins appearing in front of me. So they decide to drop past it. Now, I'm assuming it wasn't their first time. Maybe it was. But I'm assuming it wasn't. Now, they all decide to take half a tab of acid. Except for Coffee, because see, Coffee is an overachiever. Stanford graduate, software engineer at YouTube. He takes two hits of acid. He's like, oh, good old chums, you don't understand. Acid is what you Americans... Ref-. He's American, too, I don't know. I just imagine him very posh, because Stanford graduate, right? Just, I graduated from community college, so anyone who graduated from college is posh. Anyways, he goes, I'm going to take two hits of acid. I'm going to do better than all you guys, just like I did better than you guys on the SATs. And they're like, dude, we all have the same job. You don't have to be a jerk. So, they're partying. Now, at 3 p.m., so they started pre-gaming really, really early. At 3 p.m., Coffee starts freaking out. He's like, oh, oh man, I don't know what happened, old chum. I, oh, I don't know. It could be the, the, the four times the amount of acid I took over you guys. And they're like, yeah, probably. About an hour later, he goes, oh, old bean, I don't know what's going on. He looks at his friend. He's actually an old bean. He's like, oh, oh, I don't know what's going on. I need to, I need to steady myself. I need to steady myself. And he takes two more hits of acid. He's already having a bad trip. Takes two more hits of acid. His friends are like, don't do that, dude. Like, that was the wrong move. And he's like, oh, don't tell me what to do talking watermelon. I'll take all the acid I want. Now... That happened at f- around 4, between 4 and 5 p.m. He takes the two additional hits of acid. At 8 p.m., fireworks are going off. Kids are poking each other with sparklers. Dogs are terrified. It's a great 4th of July. He wants to leave the house. He wants to leave. And they're like, dude, you are in no condition to leave the house. Friends won't let him. And then, like that, our, our fake British pal, our Stanford graduate, Turns into Jason Bourne. Now, this is where, the, first off, you're thinking, oh, Jason, a guy who's getting, taking a bunch of acid, he's going to end up running around the street naked. This guy turns into an action hero, or more likely an action villain because of what happens. This is why Kofi ended up in the hospital, paralyzed on the left side of his body, surrounded by sexy medical staff. First off, so he's surrounded by his friends, and they're like, come on, Kofi, settle down. You can't, you can't go anywhere. He punches the woman in the chest, Picks up a pencil, stabs another one of his friends. Another dude climbs on top of him. He starts choking him while punching another man in the face. So within a second, he's taken out four people. He takes off outside the house. Action music. Playing in his head because he's tripping hard on acid. Uh, Allegedly. Allegedly. This is where all the crimes begin. He jumps out. He gets in his rental car. Starts to drive away. One of his friends jumps in front of the car to be like, no, 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 don't do it, don't do it. And he ends up trying to hit his friend in the car, allegedly. And that's the last time I'm going to say allegedly. It's all allegedly. Tries to hit his friend with the car, misses, crashes into the house. Can't get the car out. Jumps out of the car. He looks. And at this point, a local like security guard for the subdivision they're staying in is approaching. He jumps out of his van. Pulls out his little flashlight. Freeze, evildoer! Coffee looks at him and goes, evildoer? More like... Can't think of anything. Can't think of a catchphrase. He starts running towards the security guard. Security guard starts running towards them. Split screen. Two different faces looking at each other. This is this 100% real. Not the split screen. That didn't happen. But all of these events did. Security guard has like pepper spray, billy club. It doesn't have a gun. But Coffee doesn't have any weapon at all. But he's running, and he's, this is insane. He sees those little lights that are, like, stuck into the ground, you know, like the little solar panel lights that people put around their yards. It kind of, like, makes it look nice, I guess. But it's these little lanterns that are all over the lawn or along the line of the lawn. Does that make sense? But underneath, the way they stick into the ground, they have a long metal spike. And they stick them into the ground. You don't have to worry about them falling over during a rainstorm. Now, <laughs> as, as beautiful as it may look as a lawn ornament, Coffee goes, uh-huh, it's time to make my point. He didn't really say that, but we'll just assume that he did. Because he picks one of those things up and stabs the security guard 
right in the chest so hard, the security guard then falls to the ground. Like a straight up, and the guy's like, whoa, falling back in slow motion, hits the ground. Coffee looks over and goes, you light up my life. And then it lights up. No, <laughs> okay. So anyways, Coffee goes running, goes running off. And he's happy that he came over that catchphrase. He gets into the security guard's car. He left it running. Keys in the ignition. Peels off. Starts driving through the subdivision. It's 8 p.m. It's 4th of July. People are outside of their houses. Just hanging out, eating hamburgers, throwing sparklers in each other's eyes, causing harmless mayhem. Coffee had other plans. He sees a young couple walking down the street. Hits him. Hits him with the vehicle. And then, like, you're at that point, you're kind of like, Jason, this stopped being a funny action story. Now he's just running over bystanders. And you would think at that point he'd be like, wait a second. I'm not Jason Bourne anymore. I'm actually some sort of horrible terrorist. He then sees an other young couple walking across the street. Hits them too. So at this point, it's pandemonium in this neighborhood. The police show up. Sheriff and CHP. They're, they're like, we need to get these sirens fixed. That sounded terrible. Cop cars pull up. Coffee is driving down the street in his van towards the cops. Cop jumps out of his car. Stop. Stop. The car is coming closer and closer and closer. Cop's like, stop. Stop the car. Coffee goes, things are about to get complicated. He's gunning it right towards the cop. The cop waits until Coffee's van actually strikes his vehicle before opening fire, hitting him three times, one time in the head, putting him in a coma, and paralyzing him from the left side. Not left side down, it's the left side over. Paralyzed. Everyone survived, so I don't want you to feel bad about it. The, the One of the women who got hit by the car was airlifted out, but everyone was survived. They probably got a couple of broken bones, probably pretty scratched up. Dude who got stabbed with the light survived and everything. I'll tell you one thing that didn't survive. Uh, Coffee's freedom. He's facing five counts of assault with a deadly weapon, two counts of attempted murder, two counts of assault on an officer, and one count of carjacking because he took the dude's car. You figure that would kind of just be theft. But anyways, 32-year-old Stanford graduate, software engineer YouTube, $2.35 million bail for taking four hits of acid. But I find that stories like that fascinating. We've talked about it before, about people just snapping. To me, that's the scariest of crimes. Like, organized crime, stuff like that. Like, they always have, like, an end result. Serial killers, they can't get it up. Women intimidate them. They're a bunch of just weak, spineless individuals. So that's why they kill. Their mama was mean to them. That's why they kill. They can't get it up. Their dick doesn't work. Organized crime... They're saying, we need money. Like, this is one of the things we do to keep order is commit these crimes to do these murders. But when people just snap, I think that's the scariest thing because it really is unpredictable. This dude was probably never on anyone's trouble charts for years and years and years and years. And then this happens. Now, yes, the four hits of acid did help that. But still, though, and his life will radically change. He'll probably do eight to ten years, plea down, because he has a you know doesn't have a troubled life, stuff like that. He might do eight to ten years. He's going to be sued into oblivion by these people. But because of one afternoon, his life has changed forever. I find that fascinating. And and he almost murdered multiple people. He tried to, allegedly. I find that stuff fascinating. But anyways, let's go ahead and move on to our next story, which actually is a story that I came across. Both of these stories I came across right after the end of season five. There's a couple that popped up, and I was like, oh, man, but I had to take that break off. It really is refreshing for me to take that break off. So I'm glad you guys are coming back to the show. And, yeah, it'll probably be about two weeks. I'll be in Sacramento, but we'll be on a regular schedule and all of that. So let's go ahead and move on to the story of... Where'd you go, bro? I saw a movie last night. I've been watching a ton of movies on my vacation. Like, I've been doing nothing. It was Jersey Shore Shark Attack. I will tell you this, and I know a lot of you people will not agree with me. It's not a very popular opinion. May lose a couple listeners over it. It's Jersey Shore Shark Attack actually was pretty good, but that's not the unpopular opinion. It was a parody of Jersey Shore, but a bunch of sharks showed up. 
I think Snooki is hot. I know a lot of people like think she's like trashy. I've always had a thing for Snooki. And she's one of those women who gets hotter the older she gets. Like normally, well, I'm not going <laughs> to finish that sentence, but Snooki actually is really hot. Like now that she's a mom, she has like three kids and stuff like that. I actually find her more attractive than she when she was like a drunk chick on the boardwalk. So good on you, Snooki. God, I love Snooki. So anyways, and they had an actress portraying Snooki. And somehow she was actually even hotter. Very distracting movie. But anyway, so it was good, though. Check it out. Jersey Shore Shark Attack. It was funny, too, which is really hard to pull off. Horror comedies are incredibly hard. Let's go ahead, though, and get to our second story for the evening. The year is 1963. It's February 1st. And Thomas Meehan, 41-year-old state worker, is driving home from Eureka, California, to Concord, California. Now, that's quite a distance. It's quite a distance. He was on a business trip. He had to drive home. And he was a prominent member He was a prominent member of the community in Concord. He was like on the hospital board. People knew him. He was very, very well-liked at work and around town. A stable individual, if there was one. Four hours out from home, he calls his wife and says, You know, I'm not... I don't feel good. Something's wrong with me. I don't feel good. And his wife's like, oh, honey, just get a hotel somewhere. You'll be fine. You'll be fine. He's like, that's why does my wife sound like a creepy goblin all of a sudden? But he ignores that. So he goes to the town of Garberville and checks into a hotel around 5 o'clock, around 5 p.m. Nothing suspicious about that. Just another businessman traveling through a sleepy little town in California. At 6.45, Thomas Meehan walks into the Garberville General Hospital. Nurse is like, smacking gum. Yeah, what do you want, buster? We got a lot of injured people tonight. What are you here for? And Thomas goes, I feel, I feel dead. I feel dead all over, was his exact words. Nurse goes, take a number. Go sit in that other room. Now, you may think I'm making a joke. She didn't have a, she she wasn't from the Jersey Shore. But, oh, that'd be hot if she was snooky as a nurse. Sexy nurse outfit. They were busy. And they did say, go sit in another room. We'll see you in a bit. And Thomas just, like, he had that conversation with the sexy, sexy, snooky nurse. And then hung around for a bit, but then left. At 7 p.m., so 15 minutes later, two witnesses are driving down the road. They're driving down Highway 101. And they see a car go off the road into the brush and where the Eel River is. Eel River is this river that cuts through that part of California. They call the cops. Now, again, there's a bit of delay there. No one had cell phones back then. They go to a payphone to call the cops, say, we saw a car go off the side of the road. And cops, of course, are like, where's that? What time did you see the car? They say 7 p.m. is when we saw this happen. 8 p.m. Thomas Meehan walks back into his motel. And the night manager's sitting there filling out some paperwork. And Thomas Meehan walks in. And what the manager notices is that his ankles, like the pants, his ankle pants, the, what am I trying to think? His pants, his pants from the ankles area. I don't know why I'm having such a hard time telling you this. His pants were wet, is what I'm trying to say. And his shoes were wet. And he could hear him going... And they're like, you chewing gum, mister? He's like, yeah, I got it from Snooky, but... That sound you heard was actually my wet, wet shoes walking through your lobby. And Thomas Meehan walks up to the manager and goes, this is an exact quote. He goes, do I seem dead to you? I feel like I'm dead. Manager's like, no, no, you don't. I mean, you look, you know, kind of weird. And Thomas Meehan just kind of walks away. It's not like a mysterious, he just turns like a zombie and walks away. He also says, hey, can you call my wife and conquer? Yeah, 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 I'll take care of you conversation doesn't really go anywhere and thomas Meehan goes to his motel room anyways at 9 30 another motel employee goes into his room and says hey we tried calling your wife in concord but there's something wrong with the phone connection we can't get a hold of her and thomas is like okay okay and then that employee says we just sat and talked about the weather for a bit like it was a normal conversation there was nothing weird about him except for one detail he was wearing different clothes now he seemed to be wearing like a formal attire like a black tie suit 
black slacks, black jacket, white shirt. And he goes, and what was weird is I didn't really see him come in with any luggage, but he was wearing different clothes than we had seen him earlier. And you figure, yeah, his pants were wet, so he's going to change his clothes. At 10.45 p.m., the cops are at the river, the Eel River. And they're looking around, and they see this car in the river. The, the convertible roof had been ripped open. The front end had been damaged. So it definitely had gone off the road and impacted into the river. It wasn't like under 10 feet of water. It was just like poking out of the river and hit something. But there was a pair of glasses, just reading glasses, just neatly folded up and sitting on the passenger seat. All this violent action around the car and you have those glasses there. Cops are like looking around and they're like, well, we don't see a body. This is weird. And the other guy's like, hey, Tommy, look over here. Shining the flashlight all dramatically on the ground. They see a set of footprints. Bloop, bloop, bloop. Not magically appear in front of them, but they see a set of footprints in the mud heading up the bank. And they're like, oh, whoever was in this car accident that happened almost four hours ago, it took us that long to get out here. That's weird. Actually, that's a weird detail. It took them that long. But we'll get to that. That's weird. I didn't put that connection. In. Anyways, the cops are out there. Oh, you know what? Actually, now that I think about it, the cops probably showed up shortly, but it took them a while to find where the car was. I don't know. That's kind of a weird detail. But anyway, so the cops start following the footprints up the bank, and they're looking at these muddy footprints leaving leaving from the car up the bank, and then they just stop. Cops are looking at each other, shining their flashlight around, looking through the brush. And they see where the ground was still soft. They see where there still should have been more footprints, but nothing. It was like someone was walking up out of the bank and just vanished. That all happened on February 1st. On February 20th, 41-year-old Thomas Meehan was found in the Eel River, drowned. Body just floating around, bobbing around in the river. Now, this story is very Twilight Zone-ish. It's very Carnival of Souls. But what's interesting about it was this was reported on by the Los Angeles Times and I think it was the San Diego Times. It might have been the San Diego Tribune and a couple other newspapers, major newspapers at the time, because it's such a bizarre story. And it's one of those stories that everyone kind of goes, what? It really makes you scratch your head. Now, one thing is clear is that he was people. He interacted with people in these different locations. It was Thomas Mahan's car in the river. They knew that from the make and model of the car, registration, things like that. That was 100% his car. But the people who saw the car go over, they didn't couldn't identify the driver. But you had the person at the motel take his payment, have several conversations with Thomas Meehan. And then you had the nurse at the hospital, Snooky, who identified him as well, had to take his information to treat him. At both of those locations, he said, I feel like I'm dead. I feel like I'm dead. And the first time that he was spotted, acting like a big old weirdo, at 6.45, he walks into the Garberville General Hospital. At 6.45, he checks in with the nurse and says, I feel dead. I feel dead all over. Can you treat me? Fifteen minutes later, his car is spotted going off the road. It's possible, yes, Jason, that he left. He was not feeling good. He already called his wife and said he was not feeling good. He went to the hospital, said, I'm not feeling good. They said, you're going to have to wait a bit. He waited a short while, got in his car, drove away, and whatever he wasn't feeling good about, crashed into the river. But from the hospital to any point at Eel River, from Garberville to any point at Eel River, it's a 55-minute drive. So he would have had to driven incredibly fast to leave the hospital and crash into that river 50 minutes later. It's nearly an hour away. Is that impossible? Could you go 150 miles an hour? Sure. But it's an odd detail. You think he would have been seen speeding 150 miles an hour before he got there. Odd detail. The car crashes. This was what I thought happened because I'm fairly skeptical about a lot of this stuff. This was my read on this. The car crashes. He gets out of the car. He starts walking up the bank and then he just stops leaving footprints. Not because of any magical thing, but his feet aren't sinking in as much as they were. And what the cops had just mis- misidentified the scene. He then goes to the hotel. Like, I don't think he was feeling good at all. He's driving along. He does starts feeling sick. He calls his wife. He goes to the hospital. He's not feeling good. He goes, this isn't worth it. He goes to the river somehow. He gets there going 150 miles an hour, crashes into the river, and then walks out. 
And when he goes to the hotel, he says, I still don't feel good, but I think he's still in shock that the fact that he got in this car accident. He goes to the hotel, his pants are dripping wet. He goes, he changes his clothes, and at some point he suffered some sort of brain damage or was not feeling good already, plus <laughs> plus the horrible car accident. At some point he goes, oh crap, my car is in the river. Because he's not thinking right, he got some brain damage. He will then walk back to the car and he drowns. Like he's messing around with his car, he's trying to pull it out or whatever, and he drowns. When, the thing about being skeptical is usually... Like, everything I said, as stupid as a decision it could be, are things people would do. I.e., taking two extra hits of acid when you're already having a bad trip. People do stupid things, especially if you've had a concussion or something. He could have walked back to the hotel and then realized, you know what, I'm just going to go back and pull my car out of the water myself. The problem with that version of events is that he would then have to walk back. You would figure that... Actually, now that I think about it, if he... Wait, whoa, okay, I didn't think about this. If he... If Garberville's 55 minutes away and he drove there in in 15 minutes and got in this car accident at 7 p.m., at 8 p.m. he comes back to the motel, you couldn't, a 55-minute drive, you couldn't walk in 55 minutes. That's impossible. And there's no, I didn't see any record of a taxi cab picking this guy up. So, as a skeptic, I thought that it was probably something likely happened. But at the same time, we also have to say there are a lot of weird things going on here. Let's throw off our skeptic caps and put on our conspiracy caps. Guy gets in a car accident. This is my this is my conspiracy, not conspiracy theory. This is my paranormal take on it. He knew he was going to die. His body knew that this was his last night on Earth. He wasn't feeling good. But it was time to go. So he's facing two different things. His body is basically saying goodbye to the mortal world. Because I've always wondered if the day you die, if you know you're going to die. We look at people and go, whoa, he was just walking down the street. He got hit by a car. But we don't know if that person was like, you know what? I just have a feeling I'm going to die today. And for someone who suffers anxiety attacks like I do, that's not a fun thought. Because I always think I'm going to die every single day. But I wonder that. So maybe that's the reason why he wasn't feeling good was that he was like, I'm going to die today. And he goes to the hospital because he thinks I'm going to die today. And they're like, no, you're a lunatic. He goes, drives, he gets in the car accident. And at that point, he basically splits into his own little multiverse. He basically quantum reality or what is it? Basically quantum immortality is where you die, you move to another universe. He just kept moving into the same one. I know this is getting really weird. He dies in the car accident, and his body floats out into the river. Okay. But his, him, not his spirit, because he's walking around signing paychecks and opening doors and stuff like that. Him also splits off into the Thomas Meehan who starts walking up the bank of the river. But because that's a physical impossibility, everything's like... Things are happening that are impossible to happen, i.e. walking a 55-minute drive in an hour. He appears at the hotel. He goes there. Do I feel dead? He was already dead at that point, and you can make the argument he may have even died of a heart attack way before he even got to Garberville. Like, he could have been splintering out every single way. The fact of the matter is, he is dead, and people seeing him around town, around the time he should have really been floating down the river, face first. I know that's kind of a brutal image, but it really makes you que- I, I, I it really makes you question a lot of things. That's why I really like this story. Because it makes you wonder if you've ever interacted with somebody who's already dead. This was a big story because he was such a prominent member of his town. The sheriff from Concord drove hours and hours and hours and up with like a team of 20 people to investigate this. They wanted to know what happened to their buddy. That's why it was such big news. But you wonder, you ever go to like a fast food restaurant, you're sitting at a bar, there's a kid sitting next to you on the bus, and you look over at them and they look normal, but there's something a little off about them. No, they're not going to turn to you and say, do I look dead? They don't know you. They just know they're not having a good day. They know that there's something not right in the way they feel today. You just kind of sit there and you watch them. 
They just seem to be staring off into the distance. Then eventually something catches their eye or they get reminded of something and they stand up and walk away. You never see them again. They're just a passerby. We run into hundreds of people a day in the modern world. But what are the... And it's statistically improbable that this would happen. But what if that person was already dead at home, sitting in their favorite chair, and they've passed away? But somehow they're not a ghost. They can still interact with the environment. They can still talk to people. They don't have chains. But they're still able to move about the world for a short amount of time. And them not really knowing that they're dead, still interacting with us. Do you think that's possible? And if that is possible, who's to say I'm not already dead? And you're listening to a podcast recorded by a corpse. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be our email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash deadrabbitradio. Twitter is at Dead Rabbit Radio. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great one, guys. <laughs>